their relationships are with one another. I had this amazing conversation with a radio broadcaster two weeks ago. It didn't occur to him that the stars that we recognize as making patterns don't see themselves as belonging in that pattern. They don't all move over time in the same direction to keep that pattern. It's what we see from here. And it was really difficult to communicate that to him because he didn't have a wakeful relationship to that inner picture and he didn't know the, the constellations either. So we had to really slow down so that he could get to his question. <coughs> there was all this assumption that went on and this idea that it's fixed and it stays there. What Rudolf Steiner suggests, and even the name of Willy Zucker's book, Willy Zucker was an anthroposophist that developed astrosophy, cosmic Christianity and the changing countenance of cosmology. And that's not just the study of this world, but that that world is changing. And its change is being informed by us. We belong to that conversation that's taking place. There is a constant interchange taking place. And we can awaken to that by becoming aware of the rhythm, its rhythm. We don't have to, because like it says right there, we have freedom. <laughs> we don't have to live within that greater harmony. But we're starting to find out in very dramatic ways what it means when we don't live within that rhythm. The more abundantly the harmony of the cosmos fills the soul, the more peace and harmony there will be on the earth. This is my favorite quote from Rudolf Steiner. When we look into the planetary and starry world and see the rhythm of relationship going on there and seek to fill ourselves with what that is, then that radiates out into our world in a peaceful and harmonious way. I want to believe that that is so. And I think it's worth a try to find that, to find out, is that really the case? Is it really true that by being exposed to the night sky, I can have that experience? So now to jump back to Milwaukee. I was accused of this not being a real tangible enough issue to stand for. There wasn't enough social activism in it. And I was really having a hard time in dealing with this confrontation that was put before me. And I had to have that moment of <coughs> presence. And I was there to talk about solstice, so I thought, oh, I'm being forced into solstice right now. This active stillness. It's not this. You're just resting. It's active stillness. So no, neither fighting back or taking off this fight or flight complex, but being present. And the moment I touched that in myself, a deep sadness overcame me that the person to whom I was speaking didn't have access to the harmony of the night sky. Just didn't exist for her. It wasn't really what was real or what mattered. But when I walked away from that experience, I really felt a strengthening of my conviction that this is so. It does matter. We need to steward these resources, these natural resources that we have, and dark is one of them, and we need it. It's not happenstance that the sun sets and we go into darkness every day, that we fall asleep every day. We need that. Something is going on. Even if we can't articulate spiritual processes, something is happening in that that we need for our own health and well-being and for the health and well-being of our planet. So this image comes from an amazing artist in Southeast Michigan by the name of Sophie Takada. She's French. And she, like many artists in the anthroposophical movement, has taken it upon herself to recreate the images that are inspired by the calendar of the soul. So as I shared with you, these images were uh, based on the original images created by Ima von Eckhardstein, who was a contemporary of Rudolf Steiner. This image is coming from this artist and her own contemplation of the weekly verses. And the reason I, I asked her right before I come here, can I please share these? Because in me, they really resonate with what's happening at this point in the cycle of the year. This is the image that belonged to about three weeks ago in the shrouding womb of winter. And then <coughs> in winter's depth is kindled true spirit life with glowing warmth. So we've still got this blanket of snow on the earth, but something 
is starting to stir. And if we go back to this idea that Rudolf Steiner suggests that there's something occurring with the growth forces that finally become present in this time, right here at Cross Quarter Day, then we have this image, which really shows this kind of the angle or the angular nature of it is like it gets fixed into place. And if you're like me, looking at it in your own biography, and you keep a journal, when you go back in your contemplation and review of the course of the life of the year, you look back at this time and say, what was it that took place that did or did not confirm this idea? Something is happening right now that come harvest time, I'm going to experience. And if I start to think in rhythms, like the human rhythm, one of the most important ones is nine months. <clears throat> From conception to birth, I can conceive of an idea and something will be brought forth from that nine months later, maybe. This moment here could be a conception of something that's going to occur nine months from now, but this could also be the birth of something that was conceived nine months ago. And to start to look at life in that rhythm and to understand, is it, is it present in my life? Do I belong to this? There's something life-affirming about it, but I have to do that work. I have to take that up. It's not going to happen out there away from me or for me. So this verse was given by Rudolf Steiner to Marie Steiner in December of 1922. And it's a very well-known verse in anthroposophical circles where I work because it has to do with the relationship between the human being and the stars. Stars spake once to man. It is world destiny that they are silent now. To be aware of this silence can be pain for earthly man. But in this silence there grows and ripens what man is speaking to the stars. To be aware of this speaking can be strength for spirit man. Spirit man refers to a very specific state of being that's described in spiritual science. But this verse refers to the history or the historical development of human beings' consciousness around that starry world. This first line, again, I'm hearing that sound again. The first line, stars spake once to man, refers to the period of time of astrology, astro logos, stars speaking. When a human being is still living in greater consciousness with regard to the rhythms of that world. And then, world destiny that they are silent now, this refers to the time of Copernicus, and the beginning of the scientific revolution and the foundation of what we know as astronomy. So during the development of astronomy, this awareness that the starry world is living and speaking to us grows silent. So that we can focus here and develop consciousness here. You could say this is really a bad thing, or you could say this is necessary for us to become self-aware. But once you become aware, then you realize that something has happened to this relationship that I had. And this is where there's the description that this awareness can bring pain. Pain is part of this process. It, it informs this longing to reunite with that and not to go back to astrology, but how do we move forward? And who's gonna tell us? Who's gonna say, okay, Mary, here's the star that you came from. Who has that kind of knowledge? What kind of life do you have if you're seeking that star? And if it's a life that's taking you away from the earth, then what's the point? It's got to be something that strengthens my capacities to be on the earth, to be awake to the forces of my environment, and my environment doesn't end at the visible horizon or at the orbit of the moon. I can see stars that are pretty far away. It's not so much that it took billions of light years for that light to get here, but that I'm encountering something right here, right now in that environment. Does that not belong to my environment? Does it not have substance for my consciousness right now? So this, for me, is what belongs to astrosophy, astrosophia, star wisdom. So we move from star speaking, astrologos, to star knowledge, you could say, astronomy, this body of knowledge about the physical environment, to astrosophia, the wisdom of recognizing, yes, there are laws that govern the physical world, 
And these laws we can use to describe the motion of the celestial environment around us and there's a gesture of the spiritual world also in that motion. And as we move further through time, we will find a way to live in harmony with that and not diminish our consciousness of being self-directing, but support that capacity by choosing to live in harmony with this. And I think, and I may be naive in this, but that on a farm, you're forced into that in a way that's more powerful than in other ways. Because you're really engaging with the natural world. And in that environment, there are laws at work that aren't always easy to describe. And where do those things come from? And what rhythm are they living in? Now, the relationship between the stars and the human being is quite a bit different than the relationship between the stars and the plant. So I can't really speak to that. But human beings are engaging with the plant world and the animal world. Each of us have our own rhythm. <coughs> We can force bulbs, or we can do <coughs> things that take the plant or take the animal out of its rhythm. But is it, is it healthy for us to do that consistently? We can. As we know, was in the ancient Egyptian culture related to the god Osiris, god of the dead. And in the mythology of Osiris, the story is, well, it's fascinating how the Egyptians reconciled the calendar the five extra days that it takes to get from the beginning of the year to the return of the sun to that starting point. It's not 360 degrees, nice tidy circle. It's just around 365 days. And this, the, the story that comes out of this culture related to that has to do with the birth of Osiris. And it is that his mother is unfaithful to her husband, Ra, the son of the king. And when he finds out about her unfaithfulness because she has gotten pregnant, he curses her and says, you shall give birth in no month and in no year that belongs to the Egyptian calendar. So she's cursed with perpetual pregnancy. But she has other friends and lovers, one of them, Tehote, who is gambling with the moon. He wins the 72nd part of every day from the moon. And after he has five full days together, these are placed at the end of the Egyptian calendar, and she can give birth. First to Osiris, and then I may not have the order exact, but Nephthys, Typhon, Isis, and Seth. They are all born during these five days. And Osiris is one of the most important gods in this ancient Egyptian world. And when you look into the night sky, when you find the three stars that make up the belt of Orion, who is related to this god, they point down and left to the brightest star in our experience, which is the star Sirius. So whereas Orion is related to the story of Osiris, Sirius is related to the story of his consort and queen, Isis. So the star Sirius is regarded as the resting place of the soul of Isis. Well, in the story of, of Osiris, it's that he is slain <coughs> through some trickery by his brother, and he is dismembered and cast out his body parts around Egypt, and that Isis has the task of remembering him, putting this body back together. And it's not just that she goes forth and gets the body parts and puts them back in their place, <coughs> but that each community where she goes to gather the part of the body of Osiris that has been <coughs> cast there, she teaches sacred ceremony according to the body part that is there, the right hand, the left foot, the head. And that this is the way the community identified itself as being home to one poor part of the member of this whole being. So this is a, an idea that lived in the ancient Egyptian culture around the god Osiris. Rudolf Steiner then shares a story in the early 1920s about Isis. And the story is that like Osiris, she too is slain. But rather than being cast into a grave of the earth, as Osiris has been, she is slain and cast into the celestial cosmos. And her grave is the thinking that comes out of celestial mechanics. 
that says all of this movement and gesture is the